Welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Johannes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting software engineering for supply chain. Software is the foundation of a modern um, supply chain practice. Yet, um, most supply chain textbooks vastly underemphasize the role of software in supply chain. Software for supply chain isn't uh, a mere requirement like access to means of transportation. It is much more than that. Um, from the perspective of a supply chain practitioners, most of the work is driven by software, driven by software bugs or the limitation of software, driven by software-related concerns. Software engineering is um, the discipline that comes with the ambition to help people conjure better software, to get more from software, um, to conjure faster this software, and um, to spend less to achieve more. The goal of this lecture is to understand what software engineering is about and um, to understand its prime relevance for supply chain. The goal of this lecture is also um, to understand what, as a supply chain practitioner, um, you can do to avoid crippling your supply chain either through action or inaction that unfortunately happen to antagonize your software undertakings. The 20th century has been the century of the mechanization of the workforce. Um, large companies and large supply chains, as we know them, did emerge in the 20th century. And the progress delivered by the mechanization of the workforce has been incredible. During the course of the last century, um, for almost every labor-intensive task the, um, that are related, relevant for uh, supply chain, um, what may be production or distribution, the productivity during the course of the last century has um, increased by um, a hundredfold or so. And on the contrary, I believe that the 20th century is and will be um, the century of the mechanization of the intellectual work. And, uh, and this set of, I would say, this set of this transition is very difficult to apprehend. Actually, the, um, the sort of intuition that applies when we go from the mechanization of the physical workforce do not translate at all into the sort of intuition that applies when we go into um, the mechanization of the intellectual work. I'm not saying that um, the transition is any less dramatic, uh, but um, the reality is that at this point of time, the transition um, toward, I would say, the, tr the, the, um, the, the elimination of the uh, workforce that was dealing with very, very labor-intensive tasks is already behind us. I checked in, um, in 2020 in, in France, um, there is now 27 million people who are essentially that have white collar jobs, so they are, they are essentially office employees, while there is only less than a million people left with, that are essentially uh, factory workers. So we have a ratio of, of, of 27 to 1. And now the thing is that uh, when we start to look at uh, what the mechanization of the intellectual work entails, it is, um, it is very surprising and it is also very related to a paradox that is known as the Moravec paradox. So Hans Moravec um, was um, a computer scientist and in 1980 he basically remarked that um, as far um, uh, computing was concerned, the task that seems the most difficult for the human mind, like for example, becoming uh, a chess grandmaster, were actually the sort of tasks that were the easiest to tackle with computers. On the contrary, um, if we are looking at tasks that seems extremely easy for humans, like standing upright on two legs, those tasks prove to be incredibly challenging uh, for, for computers. And that's the essence of this, this uh, Moravec principle is that our intuition about what is difficult to achieve in terms of intellectual tasks with computers is, uh, is, is very, very deceptive. And also, one thing uh, that, is, that complicated the problem further 
is that suddenly when we are talking about the automation of the uh, of the of essentially the white collar employee is that it is done by the white collar employees themselves um, this was not the case with the blue collar uh, factory workers you know they were not the one to decide that the that the, the factory will be mechanized further and that will eliminate their jobs yet this is what is happening as far white collar jobs are concerned and thus we have, uh, we have a challenge where not only uh, the mechanization process, uh, the sort of process that is involved in the mechanization of the integral work is deeply counterintuitive. This is the Moravec paradox. But um, the management of the people who are in charge of implementing this mechanization, namely software engineers, is in itself very, very counterintuitive. And this is probably one of the biggest challenge for supply chains is literally the management of the people who will be in charge one way or another to deal with this mechanization. And here, um, I, I can't help but remark that many supply chains and many and, and their associated companies are still firmly anchored in, a, a, I would say, in the 20th century mindset where essentially you approach the world as if, you know, uh, the, the corporate world as if you had white collar uh, people that are doing the intellectual work and then they are going to come up with, you know, the solution, the plan, and then the plan is then handed over to blue collars for the actual execution. But as we have seen, you know, with a ratio of 27 uh, people to one when it comes to office jobs versus uh, factory jobs you know, in, in France, uh, the, probably the statistics varies if you look at a few other countries, although I suspect it remains remarkably similar in most developed countries. You'd see that this is not the way it happens. Now it is literally about uh, automating your own work. Uh, and it means that in this world, in this world of the 21st century, the very best white collar employees are the ones that constantly manage automate themselves to make themselves op obsolete and then move on to something else. And that is, I would say, very um, challenging for many companies that are still very much rooted in the 20th century. Opinions diverge widely about um, the very notion of software engineering. One of the strongest criticism came from um, uh, Distra, one of the founding fathers of uh, computer science. And essentially, according to Istra, software engineering is, in a way, not even possible as a discipline, as a field of research. And he said that basically it boils down or devolves into um, how to program if you cannot sort of recipes. So basically, the, the criticism of Distra, which is very interesting, is that um, Software engineering devolved into some kind of self-help fiction that do not that cannot possibly succeed. And indeed, if we propose that the goal of software engineering is to ensure um, the success at, uh, at at creating useful software, you know, superior software, then indeed software engineering is is mostly doomed. Um, my uh, understanding is that success of software. Is, uh, is incredibly difficult. It is as difficult as success in science. It takes um, a spark of genius, uh, quite a bit of luck, and, and there is no recipe for that. And, uh, and moreover, every single success turns to consume the very opportunity that it, it, that it took to achieve this success, and thus the whole thing becomes completely non-replicable. Um, however, I disagree with the vision that um, software engineering is kind of doomed. I believe that we have uh, that the, the main problem is to define what is the ambition of software engineering. If we decide that the ambition of software engineering is success at creating software, then indeed it is doomed. However, if we decide to approach software engineering as um, a narrow sub-branch of experimental psychology, I believe that we can gather through this angle very uh, valuable and actionable insights. And this is the, the perspective that I will be adopting today in this lecture. Thus, software engineering is about 
software engineers, about the software engineers themselves and their interaction. It is uh, indeed focusing on the software engineers is a good starting point uh, because actually the, um, the human nature is stable over time. You know, this is very different compared to um, software technology that is changing, um, that is changing all the time. The, uh, the nature of the people who are struggling with this technology is not. This is a human nature. It has been very, very stable, I, I, as far as we can say, you know, for a very, very long time. And um, thus, and here what we see is that if we look at more generally, I would say, other fields like, like science, we can see that this approach to say we can't uh, of approaching, you know, a field through the lens of the inspection of what its practitioners are doing can be very, very fruitful. For example, in science in general, it is now very, very widely established that a conflict of interest leads to bad science and uh, a corruption of knowledge. This is something that has been, uh, I would say, uh, demonstrated numerous amount of time. There is very, very little doubt that a conflict of interest is completely toxic. And this point was previously covered in, uh, in, in the lecture uh, titled Adversarial Market Research for um, Enterprise Software. And, and here we see that from this perspective, we see that although it is not necessarily pos pos possible to have, uh, I would say, to gather insights that would be widely applicable about the practice itself, it is possible to gather insights that are um, of wide, um, I would say, of, of wide applicability and wide relevance if we focus on the practitioners themselves. And thus, software engineering is literally about the people who are uh, dealing with software technology and their struggle and their process, uh, and not very much about the technology itself. Today is um, the sixth lecture of the fourth chapter. This chapter is dedicated to um, the auxiliary sciences of supply chain. So that's, um, those uh, auxiliary sciences represent elements that are, I believe are of foundational importance for a modern supply chain practice, but they are not, strictly uh, speaking, supply chain uh, elements. They are more like supporting elements for your um, supply chain practice. And um, so far in this fourth chapter, we did start uh, with literally the physics of computing with um, dealing with modern computers. And then we have been moving you know, upward through a, through a ladder of, of, um, of abstractions. We move from uh, um, computers to algorithms that represent the, the tiniest, smallest bits of interest of software. Then we move to uh, mathematical optimization, which is of interest for supply chain, but also for plenty of other, uh, I would say, um, relevant software undertakings, such as machine learning. So we have seen that mathematical optimization is directly interesting for uh, supply chain, but it is also directly interesting for machine learning, which in turn turned also to be of interest for supply chain. And then we, we have seen that uh, as far as mathematical optimization and machine learning, uh, as far as those two fields are concerned, most of the uh, very interesting concepts and paradigms um, nowadays are of a programmatic nature. So it's not just simple algorithms. It is literally uh, something that is incredibly expressive and that needs to be addressed through the lens of, um, of programming languages. And that's why the last lecture was about um, languages and compilers. And today, we are still moving up the, this ladder of abstraction, and then we focus on the people instead of focusing on what they are doing, we are going to focus on those people themselves, thus the software engineers, and that's the whole point of this um, software engineering um, analysis. And today, I will be more specifically presenting two, set, uh, two sets of views about um, software engineering. First, I will be presenting um, the mainstream view. So that's, that's a view that I, will, uh, that I believe dominate in the field. Unfortunately, um, this is also, this, this mainstream view is also the sort of view that um, I would say 
uh, generated the sort of criticism that I mentioned from, from Distra, where essentially with people that present things that are very much of a self-help nature and, uh, and, uh, and that, that some very people have, I believe, and, my, and I include myself, a lot of reason to oppose because it is not, uh, it is, I would say, not a realistic ambition for the discipline of software engineering. Nevertheless, I will be surveying this, um, this mainstream view if only because the, some of the very, some very misguided insights are still incredibly popular and thus uh, having, uh, being familiar with those misguided concepts is uh, of prime importance if only to root out very incompetent people that are endangering their, uh, your supply chain through their own incompetence. And then um, I will move toward um, um, this view from the trenches that is um, pretty much a collection of elements rooted in my own personal experience as a CEO of um, a, a, a software company that happens to be operating precisely in the field of um, enterprise supply chain software. Although as we will see, uh, the insights are very much uh, about the people and not really about the technology itself. The mainstream view of software engineering states that a software initiative starts with um, gathering the requirements for the piece of software of interest. And most, uh, most initiatives, most software initiatives in large companies adopt this perspective uh, through a process that typically starts with an RFP, request for proposal, or an RFQ, uh, request for quote or an RFI request for information um, and, and, and all those things are very much rooted in this perspective and I believe that this approach itself was very much inherited from um, 20th century practices that have been very very successful in mechanical engineering and um, construction works for example so it, those, those approaches were not invented by, uh, by the software industry and Yet, I believe that as far as software is concerned, those, those approaches of, of gathering requirements are deeply misguided. Um, in software, you do not know what you want. You just don't. And knowing what you want is invariably the hardest part of software. For example, if we consider a very, very simple problem like inventory replenishment, um, the problem statement is incredibly straightforward. At any point of time, I want to know the quantity that I should be replenishing, reordering for every single SKU. So the problem itself, the problem statement, is incredibly sta is simple. Yet, what does it mean uh, to have uh, to reorder a good quantity? You know, what? Uh, how do you qualify whether it is a good quantity or a bad quantity? And then, as soon as you start looking at this problem, you will see that the problem is devilishly complex and, and difficult. Um, as a rule of thumb, clarifying the requirements is vastly more difficult than writing the piece of software itself. And, thus, and, and actually, it is only by confronting uh, your intuition, uh, confronting, I would say, a piece of software that results from your intuition with um, the feedback given by the real world that um, you can let gradually the requirements emerge. You see, so the requirements don't fall from the sky. It, it, uh, the requirements can only be obtained through a fairly experimental process and you need to have this interaction with the real world. However, the only way to have this interaction is to have you know, the software products. Thus, the requirements is, gathering the requirements is fundamentally a very, very empirical and emergent process. And the problem is that by the time you are done with the requirements, then by, at this point, having the requirements is kind of moot because if um, you have the requirements, it means that you already have the corresponding product that implements those requirements. So you see, by the time you do have access to the proper requirements, then by definition, you, you already have the product that is in production up and running and the fact that you have those requirements is kind of moot. Um, thus, the, the point is that starting the process through the lens of the requirements is, I believe, a lunacy. 
um, requirements should probably come last as a late stage documentation where you document the, all the, the core reason that led you to implement the, the product the way you did. You see, not the other way around. Once requirements are laid out, um, the classic approach states that one needs to proceed with the design phase. I agree that at some point some design may happen. However, um, and so it isn't entirely wrong that there is some sort of design phase taking place. However, the sort of thinking that goes into this design phase uh, is, uh, I believe, very frequently uh, misguided. The, the problem boils down of the design phase of, um, of getting the cost of change under control. The classic non-software perspective on the cost of change is that the cost of change increase exponentially, let's say, over time. So it, it, it increases very, very fast. Just to, to think of it is that if you change um, the design of a car very, very early when you're only do it dealing with a blueprint, the cost of change is minimal. On the contrary, if you wait until the point where you have millions of those cars on the roads, um, the cost of change is incredibly high because it implies uh, some sort of recall, which can be incredibly expensive. The, however, unlike the physical realm, uh, in the software realm, the cost of change is not necessarily growing, uh, I would say, increasing exponentially. Um, the cost increase cannot be entirely mitigated. However, to a large extent, the, the, the cost increase can be mitigated. Uh, indeed, I mean, the, 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 the cost of change does increase over time, uh, mostly because code bases tend to grow over time. I've never seen uh, a code base of a piece of enterprise software significantly you know, shrink from one year to the next. Um, those things tend to, uh, to I would say, to, to keep growing. Um, however, nevertheless, it is possible to, um, to bring the cost of change to a certain degree. And nowadays, this, um, this aspect is becoming more widely recognized, even, I would say, in, in software, software circles. And by the way, this is the essence of the agile methodology you might have seen these terms you know, on um, floating around when people say, oh, we have this agile software methodology. Well, um, one of the biggest intent of um, the agile methodology is to put this cost of change under control. Um, I won't go into the fine print today in, into the, the, this agile methodology, but suffice to say that I believe this, this approach is slightly, uh, I would say, misguided when it comes to how do you uh, do that exactly to, to bring this, um, this cost of change under control. I observe that the cost of change mostly originates from the decisions that are being made about the software and um, more specifically about the fact that it is very, very difficult to resist the urge of making decisions, you know, of just calling the shots. Imagine you're, you're just looking at a, at a potential future software product uh, and, and there is plenty of decisions to be made and the early attempt would be to just make those decisions just to clarify what you have in front of you. And uh, on the contrary, a very good design is the ability, uh, I would say a very good design phase rather than good design, a very good design phase is the ability to basically postpone all the decisions that are not absolutely required uh, that, that where the product doesn't require uh, those decisions to be made now. Um, indeed, uh, if you don't take the decision, then uh, as, so, uh, as long as the decision isn't, you know, isn't made, that you've not established that you need to take this specific design approach, this specific technological approach, etc., then it's still floating in the air. It's still ready to be changed because nothing has been decided yet. And, um, and so, one of the, of the aspects to keep the cost of change under control is to learn of basically postponing all the decision to the greatest extent that is uh, practically possible. And again, from a supply chain perspective, this looks kind of very weird um, because it means, just, just think about what it means of postponing all those, all those decisions. It means that for all the, the, the people that are in the software team and also the, in all the people that are observing you know, the product and observing software team, it means that it looks as if 
um, you're being kept in the dark. And actually, and it's, and it's even worse than that because you're kept in the dark and it's done on purpose, which is very, very puzzling. And yet, it is exactly what needs to happen. And, uh, and, and it has to be done on purpose. And that's why, that's why it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of very disconcerting, to say the least. Uh, now, if premature design decisions are rooted in um, the sometimes misguided need for control, the problem um, that are associated with this need for control doesn't stop there. Um, once the design phase is out of the way, the, the mainstream view on software engineering states that uh, we should proceed with the construction of the software, also frequently called the implementation phase. And the way it is uh, typically done is to basically present some kind of waterfall projection, uh, also called Gantt charts. This is what you can see on the screen. And, uh, and I believe that this approach, Gantt charts and waterfalls, are incredibly toxic and that the toxicity of this approach should not be underestimated as far as software is concerned. Uh, approaching the problem like this is literally setting your supply chain to fail, at least as far as its software initiatives are concerned. Um, a much better way to understand what is the problem here, a much better way to approach the construction of the software is to think of it as a learning process. You see, uh, the construction, constricting the, so the software is about um, um, learning all it takes to basically get a good product. This is, this is a learning process and all those learned parts are basically a byproduct of letting um, the world interact with the software that is emerging from uh, the construction process. Naturally, you see, and that's where the problem, uh, the, the, the key problem is that with a, a waterfall projection is that you are basically projecting what you're about to discover. Um, this is just not possible. By definition, what you're about to discover was unknown until you, you discover those elements. So, so you can't project your, um, your discoveries. Uh, you can expect them, but you can, you can plan for um, stuff that will be discovered, but you can't plan, you know, the fine print of what you're about to discover. You can have hunches, but that's, that's, that's the best you can get. And that's the idea that you can actually uh, turn those vague intuition in some kind of a very precise or not even so precise, you know, waterfall prediction is again complete lunacy. And by the way, this small apparent paradox uh, about, um, you know, construction of software as a learning process also explain um, why sometimes to replicate a piece of software, uh, it can be either incredibly, I would say, easy or incredibly difficult. Um, if the team, if a team attempts to replicate, you know, a software product that is already in, in the market and that this team has access to the understanding, you know, to the lesson that led to um, the production of the software uh, that they are trying to copy as it is, then typically replicating the, pro the, the, the software product, so re-implementing, recoding the software product can be done with only a tiny fraction of the time and budget that was needed to do the software in the first place. On the contrary, if the team do not have access to this high-level insight, if, for example, and that can be done very surprising, if the only thing they have access to is a source code, so they have access to the source code they just need to, to, to replicate, then um, the, the team will very frequently end up with an ersatz of very, very low quality because essentially all the, all, all, all the, the learning parts of the, the knowledge tidbits have been lost. And so you've just replicated the kind of surface appearance of the product. Now, um, from a supply chain perspective, you see the, the biggest challenge here is to uh, manage to willingly give up uh, and tame, you know, your um, need for control. You see, the, the water shot, the, the waterfall process is literally the expression of a company that wants to control the process. And for example, if I say, Let's, let's get this project under control. That would be you know, perceived as something very, very reasonable. 
why would you do the opposite? Uh, why would you state, for example, let's have this process, this project completely out of control? But the reality is that this degree of control is a complete delusion uh, as far as software is concerned. And it completely hurts uh, your capacity to even, uh, in the end, deliver um, uh, uh, a high quality product. And that is uh, probably, you know, uh, taming, your, taming your desire for control is, from a supply chain perspective, probably the, the biggest challenge when it comes to um, the, the construction of, of software. Also, since the emergence of, um, uh, of, of, of computers, programs have been riddled with bugs, defects. And in order to address those obvious problems, uh, the mainstream view is that testing must take space, um, and testing takes many forms. Um, concerning the need for testing, I agree, although this is, this is sort of very, very, very vague at this point. Some tool emphasizes that testing needs to be done after, uh, uh, after construction. Um, some tools emphasize that uh, testing must be done uh, uh, during construction. Some other tools uh, specify that um, testing must be done before construction. Some other approach states that testing must be done uh, before, during, and after the construction of the software. Uh, my own general view on the problem is that you should do whatever it takes to keep the feedback loop as short as possible. We um, discussed this point in the previous lecture, is um, keeping the feedback loop uh, as short as possible is of critical importance to actually um, get something that actually work in the real world. And, um, and thus, I would typically recommend to pay attention to whether what you're doing in terms of testing is actually tightening this feedback loop or not. For example, for most situations, I would typically not necessarily recommend uh, test-driven development. So test-driven development is just a methodology that says that testing comes first. Um, just because for most situations, testing first will just delay the amount of time it takes to get some feedback uh, from um, about, about your piece of software from, from the world at large. Um, however, my biggest concern uh, about testing is um, an untold limitation, something that seems to be um, to be generally dismissed is that testing ultimately only assess um, compliance toward the very uh, rules that you've established yourself, you see. And the problem here is that in software, there is no hard constraints. There is no, there is no canonical way to approach you know, the adequacy of your product with regard to the problem that you're attempting to solve. Um, this is very unlike the physical realm. For example, if we're looking at um, uh, mechanical engineering, there is a canonical criterion that would be the dimensional tolerance of a part. You see, whatever you happen to be engineering in terms of mechanical engineering, dimensional tolerance is going to be of primary importance. There are, uh, it is thus, it is a, a, an obvious and natural candidate. There is no such thing as natural and obvious candidates in software. Um, and so the, the problem here becomes in terms of adequacy. And if we want to take one supply chain example, for example, would be safety stocks. It is um, completely straightforward to uh, design an automated testing suite to uh, validate safety stock calculation. It is very, very straightforward to do, to, to, to implement this sort of, of testing logic. However, this cannot tell you that safety stocks are a bad idea, and they are in the first place. So you see, you're only testing for, for what you know fundamentally. When we are dealing with a physical machine, we expect wear and tear, and thus we expect some sort of, of maintenance. Um, uh, we expect this maintenance so that we can keep the machine in working conditions. Um, however, why would software need uh, any kind of maintenance to keep operating? Um, um, certainly, we need to replace uh, computers as they, as they break down over time, um, occasionally. However, this aspect is uh, very marginal. And in uh, enterprise software, the, the, breakdown, the physical breakdowns of, of, 
of machines is not even 10% of the actual maintenance costs. This, is, this exists, but this is, uh, th the impact of this sort of maintenance is incredibly thin. Um, yet, the, the maintenance in enterprise software is something that is um, of primary importance. The maintenance costs are massive. For many uh, enterprise software vendors, uh, maintenance is literally 80% plus of the uh, engineering cost. So this is, and um, it turned out that the factors that, that, uh, that, that generate this need for maintenance have very, very little to do with, um, with, uh, with physics. The first factor is um, the willingness to pay off the clients themselves. If a vendor can uh, get away with uh, an annual maintenance fee of 20% with regard to what was paid for uh, the setup of the software during the first year, then the, the, the software vendor will charge that. So that, that essentially from the cost, from the, I would say, um, the, the, the tag price perspective, um, the cost of maintenance is literally uh, driven by um, the willingness to pay of the enterprise clients. The second factor is um, the sort of maintenance that needs to happen just to keep the software operating. Indeed, uh, just to keep the software running. Indeed, for every single day that passes, all the environment that surround the, the product of interest diverge from the product. You see, the operating system keeps evolving, the database system keeps evolving, uh, and the same can be said for all the third-party libraries um, um, that are used by the software. No software product is an island. Every single software product you know, depends on a myriad of other software products, and those other products are evolving on their own just because the people who are developing those software products you know, keep working on it, and as they work on those products, they keep changing those products. And thus, um, they, there is a point of time where um, the product that you have just stop working just because at some point there is an incompatibility. You've not done anything except not keeping up with um, the rest of the market. And thus, um, the, the, the second factor is just all the maintenance that needs to take place just to keep the software running and so keep the software compatible with the rest of the market. The third factor is um, the amount of work that it takes to keep the product useful. Indeed, uh, the software was designed, engineered at a certain point of time, and every single day that passed, the world kind of diverged from what you were seeing at the time when you engineered the pro when the product was engineered in the first place. And thus, even if um, nothing really breaks down in terms of, of hard compatibility, uh, it turned out that um, as the world you know changes, invariably the usefulness of the product decreases. Uh, because we, the world is simply diverging from the sort of expectation that were built into the product. And thus, if you just want to keep the software useful, you need to constantly maintain the software. Uh, and and from, from the supply chain perspective, um, maintenance is a big challenge. And we touch this aspect in, uh, in the previous lecture, which was about product-oriented delivery. Uh, for supply chain, because um, the cost of maintenance very much impact you know the sort of capitalistic benefits that you can have for uh, from your software undertaking. You know, uh, ideally you want your software undertaking to have a very big return on investment. But in order to do that, you need to really make sure that you don't end up with massive uh, maintenance costs because that will completely undo the sort of, uh, I would say, capitalistic profit, capitalistic return that you can get from your software investment. And the biggest challenge here, again, from a supply chain perspective, is that uh, the simplest way to, uh, to basically minimize this maintenance cost is to focus on what do not change. You see, as I said, most of the costs are related by the sort of things that happen to be changing either in the software ecosystem or in the world at large. However, if you uh, focus on the stuff that do not change, then uh, uh, you, what you get is essentially the bulk of your software 
that is only going to decay slowly because precisely most of what your software tackle is the stuff that do not change. Um, and the problem is that focusing on what do not change is easier said than done because you have a very human force that is going completely, uh, I would say, uh, that antagonizes the, this, this, I would say, this intent. And that is the fear of missing out. You see, when you are, uh, when you're looking at the press, the media, your colleagues, etc., um, the, there will be a constant stream of, of novelty, of, of, uh, of, of buzzwords, you know. And every, for every single buzzword, there, there is this urge to just, you know, due to the fear of missing out, this urge to just do the thing to not be left behind. And that is, uh, for example, all those buzzwords would be um, AI, blockchain, IoT, all those things that are very present. And I believe that in supply chain, um, those, those buzzwords are really a distraction and they significantly contribute to those maintenance problems because they are kind of a distraction from what do not change. You know, on the contrary, when you, when you start looking at those buzzwords, you are riding a wave and you're riding exactly the sort of things that are very likely to be changing over time and thus inflating your maintenance cost over time. Now that, we are, now, now that we are done with um, the mainstream view on software engineering, let's delve into a series of um, personal nuggets that should hopefully prove useful to conduct software initiatives while keeping supply chain in mind. Um, one of the most frequent problems when dealing with um, software people is a misconception about their own identity. Uh, and I'm stealing this idea from an entrepreneur uh, named Paul Graham. Um, an engineer will, for example, say, I am a Python in engineer. Uh, while it may not be as extreme, it is very frequent that software engineers perceive themselves through, uh, perceive their own identity through the sort of um, short series of technologies that they have mastered. Um, that is their skill set. And this this confusion between their identity and their skill set and, uh, and their current skill set uh, tend to be reinforced by um, the sort of hiring practices that are prevalent in the, I would say, IT world and software world at large. Um, from a hiring viewpoint, there are many companies that, that basically state in their job advertisement I need a Python programmer. So you see, there is somebody who is on one side thinking, I am a Python programmer. And then there is a company that is going to post a job position that's where it's basically written, I am, I, I, I need a Python programmer. And, and, and thus, suddenly having the sort of right identity is not just you know, something that is just a matter of perception. There are financial rewards attached to having the right identity to have the right etiquette, the right tag that you can attach to yourself. And um, so that you make yourself more attractive to the market. And so you can see that these sort of things reinforce this sort of, of identity problem. However, this, I would say, identity-driven perception where it's, uh, your, you know, technologies become attached to yourself as a software engineer leads to numerous issues that impact pretty much every single software project and supply chain software project in particular. Um, in particular, when, um, when you're interacting with a, 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 a person, or a software, typically a software engineer, that has his identity strongly attached to the sort of tech that is in place in your company, then the problem becomes that every criticism at the tech, uh, at, at the tech uh, tend to be taken from a personal angle. So you see, if, if, if you say, that uh, I am a Python programmer and, um, and you critique my software and uh, I take it personal. And that's the problem is that as, as soon as people basically take the criticism of the tech as basically a personal criticism, um, it becomes very, very difficult to, to reason about those problems. Uh, people, that, so the, those software engineers will unfortunately tend to deflect all the feedback just because, well, they, they, they kind of partially see them as, as, as personal, personal criticism. But conversely, conversely, if the company happens to be using a technology that is not the technology 
that is perceived as core identity by the software engineer. So you see the, um, your company is, uh, has some systems implemented in Java and you have a software engineer that says, I am a Python uh, programmer. Then um, all the problems will be essentially uh, perceived through the lenses that this piece of technology is crap. And so the, again, that's another sort of problem uh, where the criticism will, and the feedback will be deflected as a, an attitude of not my problem, this is just because of this very crappy technology that happened to be used here and now in this company. And so you see in both situations, whether the, the, the software engineer has an identity that is attached to the one that you're using or that he has an identity attached to a technology that you're not using, in both situations it creates a whole series of problems and the feedback gets deflected instead of being leveraged to uh, improve the technology. And now, from a, a supply chain uh, perspective, it is, uh, we have to, take in, uh, to, to keep in mind that supply chain environment is incredibly chaotic, and thus problems will happen all the time. And thus, uh, I would say, precisely due to this ambient chaos, it is very, very important to have um, teams of software engineers that can uh, look in the eyes, you know, straight all those problems and do something about it and not just deflect the feedback uh, when, when, when it happens. Uh, you see, it is very important to have, um, to gather teams that, that just don't foster drama on top of supply chain chaos due to the perception that they have about their identity. Software engineers also continuing a bit on this idea, but through um, a slightly different uh, angle. The software engineers tend to pick technologies uh, that fit their identity and the identity they want to acquire. And that latter part is important. They pick technology because they, they want to acquire the technology so that they can essentially put an extra keyword on, uh, on the resume. However, the problem is that when you do that, you start picking technologies for reasons that have nothing to do with whatever uh, it takes to actually solve the problem that your company is facing. Uh, this is the wrong, I would say, perspective to um, decide whether a technology is relevant or, uh, or adequate um, to solve the very problem faced by your company. Um, this, and unfortunately, building your resume can be a very, very powerful motivator for, uh, for, for software engineers. Again, there are some real world financial benefits associated with having a, a sort of, of, of list of, uh, of keywords uh, attached to your resume. The very best software companies out there tend to um, look down on resumes uh, where you have a long list of, of keywords. I think personally, as a CEO of Locad, if I see a resume, that has a half a page of, of keywords it, it directly discarded. However, there are many, many uh, um, companies, uh, especially mediocre ones, where it's really the norm to actually seek people that have many, many keywords because they those companies think that those people are going to be incredibly versatile and agile within the organization capable of, of tackling everything. Uh, from my experience, it's kind of the opposite, but, uh, but I would say I digress. Um, on here, uh, continuing on this poem of, of identity and resume building, there is one sort of position where you really need to pay attention to the fact that those people aren't too attached to any technology in particular. Those are um, the software architects within your company. Software architects, I mean, it is already very difficult to hire software engineers. So sometimes you have to, I would say, to compromise on your grand principles of not hiring people that have this problem or this problem or this problem. Um, however, uh, and this is acceptable, again, um, it is very difficult to hire um, software engineers. Uh, there is basically an excess of demand. There has been quite a, a, a very strong demand uh, for, for, for decades. Um, however, as far as software architects are concerned, um, uh, compromising and so picking people that have this sort of, I would say, emotional attachment to a certain piece of technology is a recipe for disaster because those people will have um, large scale impacts in your company. By the way, this problem of, uh, of, of I would say, resume building uh, bias isn't limited to software engineers, to software people. It, it, is, it also happened to IT people. 
Uh, and I've, uh, as an anecdote, I've personally met several um, uh, IT directors in, in, in fairly large companies that wanted to transition to SAP while their um, existing legacy ERP was, uh, I believe, perfectly fine. Um, and clearly, um, the, 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 the massive costs that were attached to the transition toward SAP uh, would never, offs I mean, uh, would never, you know, um, um, manage to basically not undermine the expected benefits that we get by having a more uh, uh, a more modern ERP. So clearly, here we had, I would say, an irrational behavior at play, where um, the, the the personal interest of the IT director of putting an SAP deployment on his resume was, uh, I would say, um, trumping the interest of the company itself. And one thing, if from the supply chain perspective, you see, uh, we need to pay attention to those conflict of interest. And it doesn't take that much you know, software skills or competence to be able to detect this sort of shenanigans. Um, you see, um, there are some other fields like um, medical science. We have seen that even when there are conflict of interest, even physicians and when they are uh, are capable of prescribing the wrong drugs even when they are life at stake. So that means the conflict of interest are incredibly toxic. Even when they are life at stake, it is now, again, widely proven in the literature that um, people will make the wrong call. Um, thus, just imagine you know, how those sort of things will play out in supply chain where fundamentally there is no life at stake. It's, it's just money in the end. So um, there is even less reluctance of letting, you know, those conflict of interest unfold. Unlike the, the physical realm, um, the software realm offer very, very little constraints on how do you proceed with your software initiative and um, how you approach your work. And the thing is, the human nature doesn't like vacuum. People uh, uh, can be completely unsettled by this you know, lack of, of, of structure. And as a result, um, numerous practices have appeared over the year, and they, they keep appearing. And with every single, uh, every single uh, practice comes a notion of orthodoxy. You may have heard the names of those practices that can be um, extreme programming, uh, that can be uh, domain-driven design, test-driven design, uh, microservices, um, uh, Scrum, um, agile programming, etc., etc., etc. There are tons of, 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 I would say, uh, of practices floating around, and they keep appearing over time every single year. There is a couple of practices that emerge and, and becomes like a, the, the, the new black. And, um, and the, the thing is, with every single practice, uh, they, they, there is a notion of orthodoxy. So as soon as people start uh, you know, following a practice, let's say they want to do test-driven design, there will be people in the team that says, um, hey boss, are we doing the true test-driven design? So you see people start uh, adopting um, the, 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 the right and, and they are start to be very concerned about whether they are really sticking to the core dogma. And the, the reality, the best reality is that just Software engineers are just people, and, and people just la love, you know, um, rituals and tribes. And through uh, a practice, you know, it's not just what you do. It's a sense of belonging to the tribe that actually have the same practice than you do. Um, that's why you will find, you know, uh, meetups that are associated with those, those practices as well. Again, it is fulfilling a very human need. It is actually um, very difficult and, and to some extent very depressing to be staring at a problem unsure about everything and having uh, and, and, and having almost you know nobody to relate to when it comes to how do I even tackle this this um, this very issue and the interesting thing is that while the practice can be you know questionable slightly irrational uh, to a certain point, the benefits can be can be real. Um, advertising uh, a practice inside your company and outside the moral, uh, outside the company can um, can actually boost the moral. Can also help to actually hire prospective uh, applicants. Again, in a job interview, 
uh, when people start asking you questions about um, how, how do you work here, and your answer is, well, we just improvise, you know, we, there, is no, uh, uh, we, there is no rules, we, we just don't know most of the time, we are, we are just haphazardly navigating what the world throws at us. Uh, it, it's not exactly a super, super compelling, uh, com compelling answer. So typically, it is uh, much more efficient to just inspire confidence and give, you know, uh, a presentation of the practice as, as if, you know, this thing was actually going to solve anything in your, in your company. Um, thus, but the, the key thing is that those, in the short term, so my, my point is that in the short term, those practices, you know, they're, they're not all bad, even if for the most part they're they are completely irrational. Um, uh, just generating, you know, this sense of belonging can be, can be enough. However, the thing is, it becomes poison if those practices are taken too seriously or for too long. That's the key, that's the key insight. A practice can be inter of interest just because it forces you to look at the problem from a different angle. Uh, but then you see, uh, once you've looked from the problem for a different angle, you should try to find yet another angle. You should not be sticking with one angle for, for too long. And thus, um, from a supply chain perspective, I believe that this illustrates the sort of radical oddity of the software realm. Um, you see, uh, and the, the, the radical oddity of the mechanization of the intellectual task, uh, on the factory floor, excellency means doing always exactly the same. Uh, in, the, uh, in the software world, this is the exact opposite. Uh, if you're doing exactly the same, then this is the recipe for, um, for stagnation and for, um, uh, I would say, failure uh, over time. Software is complex, and um, enterprise software even more so. Thus, you, you frequently end up with multiple engineers working you know, on a given initiative. And when you do, there is a natural tendency for specialization. And it's, it's very natural. If you give, um, uh, if there is something to be done, um, an engineer will, you know, will be picked. To, um, to, to, to do this task, and thus he this person will touch a certain portion of the code base to accomplish this task. And whenever there will be like a new thing that comes up that requires to touch the same portion of the code base, um, the natural inclination will be to actually go to the same person. And, and the, the benefits are real. This person will already be familiar with this portion of code, and thus uh, the productivity, the expected productivity, will be higher. All of that is just completely natural. The main issue is that when you do that, um, you end up with a propensity of, uh, of, of people owning a portion of the code base. You know, this becomes their bastion. And, uh, and then this creates, um, I would say, um, all sorts of problematic issues that are really attached to those, those bastions. Um, essentially, there are two classes of problems uh, with, with those bastions. The first is just the mundane track factor. Uh, ask yourself the question is, what will happen if this person goes under a truck tomorrow? You see, um, you have the problem that just the risk of, of losing the person, because the, the person, I mean, usually it's not something as dramatic as going under a truck. It's just the person quitting for another company. But nevertheless, you're always at risk of just losing this one particular employee. Um, thus, you have the, the truck factor to address. And then another uh, problem is, is simply power games. Uh, what if, you know, this person uh, just realized that uh, uh, their, their contribution is absolutely contri vital to the company. What if this person comes back to uh, the management saying, well, um, I would like to have my salary doubled, please. Uh, um, in my own experience, software engineers are, are, are not very, don't have much of a propensity to, to play power games. It is not exactly a sort of people that are attracted to this profession. But nonetheless, um, these sort of problems become increasingly frequent as you're dealing with larger companies. 
Um, there are plenty of, of practices, uh, again, um, uh, that would be software engineering practices that try to tackle the problem head on. Um, for example, pair programming. Um, however, again, the, the key insight is that too much of a good thing can be poison for the company. So the, the best thing is to be aware of this sort of class of problem uh, rather than just to stick to one particular practice that is uh, that it, that's supposed to be addressing the problem because then this sort of practice creates other problems uh, and or distract you or, or just lim restrict your capacity to have um, to, to pay attention to even other things that you have not seen yet and from a, self, a, a software perspective here the key lesson of this aspect is that um, culture is uh, the antidote to this class of, 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 uh, of problems, not, not, uh, not process. And you see, here we face a situation where we have a very subtle trade-off between um, the sort of productivity gains that you have by having people that really specialize in portion of the codes um, and, um, uh, and the sort of uh, risks that are associated with having those people literally owning those portions of the code. And what you want is to kind of cultivate uh, a sort of, a st of, of situation where um, there is always some degree of redundancy in terms of, of knowledge and, uh, and uh, of knowledge about the code base from the entire team so that basically every single piece what you, uh, that you engineer, there is some kind of overlap of, comp of competency. Uh, but this is a very subtle trade-off between you know, uh, that, you, that you need to achieve if you want to maintain uh, any degree of productivity. And thus, the, uh, and the only way to actually do that, I would say, in, in the real world is literally through some kind of well-understood culture about, uh, about software engineering. You see, there is no such thing that can guarantee that people will be curious about the work of their colleagues. You know, you can't have a process about curiosity. It has to be part of, uh, of the culture. Also, assessing the skills and competence of software engineers is, um, is difficult. And this question is key because um, although software is clearly a team effort and the team is more than the sum of its member, uh, clearly the base level of the members of the team have uh, a big impact on you know, the performance of the team as a whole. Uh, and one aspect that, uh, that I observe to be largely underestimated um, uh, by people outside the software industry and sometimes also by people inside the software industry is the importance of writing skills. Um, if you are creating software, you are catering for two distinct audiences. On one side, you have the audience of the machine. You have the audience of your compiler. You are writing code, and your compiler will accept or reject your code. This is pretty much the easy part. Your compiler is your indefatigable companion that will basically tell you this is correct, this is wrong, and, um, and the compiler, if we put aside you know, the, o the occasional bug in the compiler itself, your compiler is completely predictable and uh, it has infinite amount of patience. However, on the other side, uh, in terms of other audience, so I said you know, writing code, you have to cater for two audiences. The first is the machine. The second audience is your colleagues. And, um, and your colleagues, by the way, I, among your colleagues, you will most likely include yourself six months down the road because you write code, you will forget, and thus you, uh, six months down the road, you will wrote this code uh, thinking that it's actually a, a different person who wrote it because it, it, it seems so confused. Um, and so the, when you write code for um, your colleagues, um, the benefit is that unlike the compilers, your colleagues will actually try to understand uh, what you're trying to achieve. The compiler do not try to understand what you achieve. It's a very, very mechanical application of uh, a set of rules. Um, so though your colleagues will try to understand, but un unfortunately, they are not like the compiler. They don't have an infinite amount of patience. And also, unlike the compilers, they can be 
easily confused and misguided by your code. Um, and that's, for example, picking a memorable, insightful, uh, um, good, viable names is of primary importance. Uh, you see, it's a, a good program is not just having something that is correct. Even, for example, choosing the name of variables, the names of functions, the name of modules, all those names, they uh, are of critical importance if you want uh, to basically have some code that will play well with your colleagues. And again, your colleagues include yourself six months down the road. From a supply chain perspective, uh, again, the key takeaway is that writing skills is of primary importance. And, uh, and I would go as far as writing skills is frequently more important than raw technical skills. Um, there is um, good writing skills is your number one skill that you will need to basically tame all the sort of haphazard complexity that, uh, that is present in your supply chain. This is uh, taming the complexity of your applicative landscape is not a problem that is, uh, of, of, uh, that is a great technical challenge. It is literally uh, a challenge of organizing all those ideas, organizing all those elements, and, and having like a consistent story across the board. Those um, are very much uh, writing skills. And by the way, we did approach this um, aspect, we touched this aspect in a previous lecture that was titled Writing for Supply Chain. Um, now, if writing skill uh, is, of pro is of primary importance for, um, um, to be a, a good software engineer, there is another skill that is of primary importance to be a software engineer at all. Uh, it is tolerance to pain. I believe this is literally uh, the number one skill in the sense of what it takes to actually be a software engineer. Not a great one, just be one. Um, more specifically, when I say pain, I say all the, 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 sort, the, the resistance to boredom and frustration that goes along with the process of engineering software when facing systems that are incredibly fragile and badly designed. And they are systems that are booby-trapped in all sorts of ways. Sometimes they have been booby traps you know, by people that are not even there anymore. Um, when, you're, when you're essentially dealing with software, you have like four decades of crap under your feet, and you're struggling with that all the time. This can be an incredibly frustrating exercise at times. Um, just to give you a, 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 um, an illustration, for example, as a software engineer, you will need to have the patience to spend four hours digging um, random uh, semi-garbage conversation on a web forum about uh, uh, that mention an error code that is just the same sort of error code that the one that you're facing presently. And so you, you will have to go through this kind of nonsense for hours to get to the bottom of it. And sometimes for, for some problems, it takes weeks to go to the bottom of just one uh, seemingly trivial bug. Thus, Thus, uh, while it may come as a surprise to the audience, uh, resilience to pain, tolerance to pain, is the primary skill that it takes to be a software engineer. And actually, um, to be a software engineer doesn't take that much technical skills. Actually, I mean, there are, there are positions uh, in the software industry that requires extremely refined technical skills. Uh, and when I say there are positions, I mean software engineering positions. Uh, however, for most software engineering positions, you can get away with near zero technical skills. This may be a surprise, but again, um, uh, the bulk of software is not doing super fancy algorithms. This is some very niche position in our industry. And thus, uh, the consequence of that is that we have a very intense adverse selection process at play in the entire software industry, which is uh, which select people first that have this tolerance to pain. You see, this is a selection process. And um, it has two major consequences on the sort of people. First is that uh, as people that, you know, re that remain software engineers tend to be incredibly tolerant to pain. And when I say tolerant to pain, I mean it in terms of 
uh, pain as you know, resistance to frustration on all the sort of softer problems that you're facing constantly. As you're selecting for people that have an incredible tolerance to pain, they might not even recognize why, when by their own action they are making the, the, the situation even worse. So you see, you have your applicative landscape, you have your, the product that you're working on, and then by your own action, you can basically increase the ambient pain level because suddenly you added an extra quirks into the software product, and, and suddenly for everybody, yourself included, the pain level of interacting with a piece of software has gone up. However, if, and, uh, if you happen to be a person that is incredibly tolerant to pain, then you don't pay attention. Again, that's this adverse selection process. Most regular people would pay attention, but those regular people did not become software engineer just because they could not stand the pain. So that is the first problem. And by the way, this problem is literally intense as far uh, supply chain software is concerned. Um, because the problem with um, software, uh, enterprise software, uh, and, and supply chain software in particular, is that there are many, many parts that are just not super, super exciting. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, I don't think that there are, there are many um, engineers um, uh, that are uh, incredibly uh, uh, excited about the idea of implementing some kind of uh, 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 an MOQ management system or something. Um, uh, MOQ standing for uh, minimal order quantities. Uh, you see, this is not about designing a cool robot, a rocket, or, or something. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very mundane, uh, it, it is necessary, but it can be a bit boring at times. And thus, you end up with some people that have very uh, high tolerance to pain, and, they are, and, and it, it can make the situation really, really bad because they are already operating in a field where there is so much stuff uh, that can be incredibly boring all around the place. The second uh, big aspect of this uh, adverse selection process is that um, when people can afford the luxury of going for a lower salary, if they can you know, avoid a problem that generates an intense pain, if they can afford the, the, this luxury, then they go for it. Uh, and when I say when afford the luxury is that if you're already very well paid, then you can decide that you're just going to go for a job that, is be, that will not be maybe as well paid, but you know, if this other job comes with the benefit that suddenly the pain is much less intense, then um, most people would do it, I suspect. And actually, in practice, most people do it. And, and so it means that the people that remain in this industry where there is this, this very high intensity of ambient pain are frequently people that don't have this luxury, so that people that cannot afford to not go for the opportunity of the higher salary. And that explains, I believe, to a large degree why um, you would see that on the, on, the, on the global markets for software engineers, there is a very, very large number of people that comes from India and North Africa, is that those two places have in common of having fairly good education systems, so they, they train people that are very educated. Um, um, and um, but yet, those, pe those countries are still relatively poor. And so when people uh, end up in this sort of position, they don't have the luxury of giving up just because, again, software engineers are in a such high demand that, um, that basically salaries are higher. So, so for those people, they just, just because, again, the baseline salaries are lower, they just don't have the, lux the, the luxury of, of going for something else. And thus, they end up being very, very prevalent. And the problem associated with that, there is nothing wrong you know, with, with those countries. It's just you know, very, very basic mechanical application of, of market forces. This is not a judgment, just uh, an observation. Um, the, the thing is that tolerance to pain is not all it takes to be a great software engineer. It is just a condition, but because if you don't have that, then you're not a software engineer at all. However, if it's the only thing that you have, it's tolerance to pain is the only thing that you have, it, uh, it will make you a fairly crappy software engineer. And thus, uh, from a supply chain perspective, the, the, the lesson here is to pay really attention to make sure that the sort of teams that your ca ga company is gathering, either internally or through software vendors, you see, the sort of teams of software engineers that are being gathered, that they are people 
uh, that, uh, that don't have tolerance to pain as their only skill, because that, that, that means that you're going to have, um, I would say, a very, very poor outcome in terms of, of, of software quality, in terms of added value from the software. Again, tolerance to pain is just, it, it's required, but it's just not enough. In 1975, um, uh, Frederick Brooks was already pointing out that um, Mendes uh, were absolutely not representative of the sort of value created by, uh, by software and, 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 and the sort of representative of the value generated by software engineers at large. Almost five decades later, uh, IT companies are among the largest employers in the world. Um, in 2020, in the USA, there was uh, 3 million uh, uh, employees in the IT industry, and, um, uh, but, even, but less than 1 million people for the entire automotive industry. So now, essentially, IT industry is just people-wise at least three times more than uh, than automotive industry, and so and and most of those IT companies, some of them being absolutely gigantic, several hundred or thousands of employees, are um, not charging by the man month anymore. This was the 70s. We don't charge by man month anymore. We charge by kilo days. <laughs> kilo days is basically a thousand days of manpower, and you see the, the, the and. The situation is clearly compared to the problem that, that uh, Frederick Brooks was outlining almost five decades ago. The problem has become arguably much worse, if only due to the incredible increase in terms of scale and magnitude of the problem. However, most of the early lessons uh, are, still, are still valid. This, um, the Medical Man Month, by the way, is still a very, remains a very, very interesting book about, uh, about uh, software engineering. And in software, the one thing that you need to keep in mind is that uh, pr productivity varies enormously. On one end of the spectrum, you don't have people that have a low productivity. You have people that have a negative productivity. That means that um, on one end of the spectrum, you have people that when they start working on a software product, they just make it worse. And that is, that is so, so you see, you, you can't even make a ratio anymore between the sort of productivity of people it is, uh, it is much worse than that. You have people that will actively degrade your product. But that's, that's, uh, that's a massive, massive problem. And also, on the other end of, uh, of, um, of the spectrum, you have people that are you know, the, the so-called 10x engineers, people that have 10 times the productivity of your average engineer, uh, who hopefully has a posi positive productivity. Um, and, and those 10x engineers, I mean, my own casual observation is that they do exist. You know, it's not to me if you have people that are vastly, vastly more productive. However, uh, my own also casual observation is that this massive productivity is incredibly context dependent. And thus, you can't just transfer such a 10x software engineer from one company to the next or even from one position to the next and expect that this person will retain this incredible uh, productivity. Usually it's a, it's a combination of, of unique skills and, 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 uh, and some sort of situation that generate that. Nevertheless, it is important to, 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 to keep that in mind because it means that a tiny few people can actually drive the bulk of the value generated uh, uh, by a software product. Sometimes it's just, it boils down just to, to, to one person who is literally creating the bulk of all the, the the smart tidbits of the software and all of the, the true added value of the software and the rest being, you know, dealing with things that are, um, that are I would say, of dubious added value at best. Now, the key lesson here is remains, and that was, uh, this thing was already identified five decades ago, is that when you're running against a deadline, and this in supply chain will happen over and over, uh, when you're running against a deadline, the only reasonable option that is at your disposal is to reduce the scope of the software uh, initiative. You see, that's the only reasonable option. All the other options are worse. Um, adding manpower, is, is, it makes things worse. Um, this is literally adding manpower to, uh, to a late software project, make it later. 
Um, this was one of the statements of Brooks. It, it, is, it was valid five decades ago. It is still valid nowadays. But um, the other options also do not work. If you start having people doing over time, it will backfire because suddenly people will be tired and they will make even more bugs and thus they will delay the product further. If you try to lower the quality, then um, quality in software is such a problem. You have so many bags already that if you accept to lower the quality, you will have something that just do not work anymore. It, it, uh, th those things will just pyro out of control and explode in your hands. So you, you cannot, I would say, compromise on quality. And, um, and so this is, from a supply chain perspective, the, uh, the, the, the key lesson probably here is that if you tackle any initiative where it seems that it requires more than 10 full-time software engineers, I strongly suggest to proceed with utmost caution. Usually it's a sign that it is a very badly framed problem. You should not be needing more than uh, 10 people. It takes some kind of incredible teamwork to be able to have 10 person that works on the same product at the same time while retaining any productivity. And, uh, and, and um, in supply chain, I observe that routinely that people are, uh, are way too, ambition, uh, too ambitious in terms of, of scale and number of people involved. I see routinely you know, ERP migration pro uh, projects with 50, 100, 200 you know, people at the same time on the project. This is absolutely nonsense. Uh, this, to, to achieve this, uh, any degree of cooperation requires incredibly capable uh, team players so that you, you don't you know, lose everything through just friction. Thus, in the end, uh, if, if you're struggling, keep it very focused, very short, uh, and very narrow. Uh, don't, don't overreach in terms of, uh, of scope for your software initiative. And my final observation is, um, is a very frequent misunderstanding um, they're basic about large companies. Um, most people would say that large companies are risk adverse. This is absolutely not my experience. My experience is that large companies are adverse to uncertainty, not adverse to risk. Although from afar, the two can be confused. And from afar, the rational explanation that will be given is that we are adverse to risk, but no. The reality is that I've observed over and over that large companies, when they are faced with um, the opportunity to go for a, 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 toward a failure with absolute certainty versus the opportunity of having an uncertain success, large companies will invariably favor the, um, uh, the certainty of failure over the uncertain success over and over and over. And this, this may seem, on the surface, this may seem completely baffling and completely irrational, but it is absolutely not. Um, large companies are not one person. This is not one body. Those are political beasts. They are made of many, many people. And, and so um, politics and appearances are paramount, especially if you're in a very large uh, structure. And you see, if just think of it from the perspective of whoever ends up in charge of this software initiative. On one hand, you have an initiative that, uh, where the outcome is certain. You know, it, it, uh, yes, it will fail, it will fail, but you know, you're playing by the book. You're just playing by the rules, and everybody knows that it will fail, and everybody knows that you know that it will fail, and so you can keep face. You know, nobody will uh, blame you for playing it safe, playing it by the book, and failing, because everybody was expecting kind of a failure. I mean, again, they were not necessarily thinking that way, but just that when the failure happened, they will just rationalize it that way. And, and so they will, obviously, we prefer when people succeed, but there will be very little damage career-wise to the person who just run willingly into a wall by playing it safe by the book. On the contrary, uh, uncertain success looks, um, looks weird. So you will be doing something if you want to carry this initiative toward a path that is steering the company toward an uncertain success. It means that you will be doing things that are, that are just weird, that are just unusual. Uh, and 
you see, there is this, this, um, this quote. I, I, I did not manage to track the origin of the quote, uh, but uh, essentially the quote was saying that um, it is a sign of folly to expect that the world will change for you. Um, as a result, every innovation uh, starts with a, with a piece of madness because essentially the intent is always to change the world. Um, so you see, th there is this problem with, uh, with the uncertain success is that most likely you're going to do something that will just look plain weird. And it is very dangerous career-wise, much more so than just playing it by the book. And, um, and so if we want to get it back from uh, the supply chain perspective, the lesson here is that in the software world, it is critically important not to set up yourself for failure. Uh, uh, just for the sake of playing it by the book, especially when the book just happened to be completely bogus. Uh, and for example, and this is happening, you know, I've seen that over and over. I've seen companies fail, you know, so literally decades in a row when I was investigating uh, their, 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 their historical attempts uh, with methods like uh, ABC analysis, safety stocks, that um, methods that can be provably incorrect and that we are literally guaranteeing the failure of the corresponding initiative. And, and by the way, when I say that, but, that, but I digress, um, uh, safety stock and ABC analysis have in common of being you know, wrong for very, very basic mathematical and statistical reasons. And thus, uh, it, should n it should not come to a surprise that if you use them, then it can only fail to deliver the sort of added value. You know, it's, it's just very, very inconsistent with the sort of goals that you have in supply chain. Yet, yet it was deemed preferable to follow those methods because um, at the very least, you, it doesn't appear like crazy to do that just because it's kind of textbook material. However, um, uh, the, the lesson is that beware of, uh, of the sort of comfort that you can gain in setting yourself for failure just because you kind of eliminate uncertainty. Eliminating uncertainty is not the goal. The goal is to maximize the chance of success, not to, uh, to, 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 to reduce uncertainty. In conclusion, software engineering is too important to be left only in the hands of software engineers. Um, software is all over the place in supply chain. Um, software is driving uh, the mechanization of the intellectual work. And uh, we are still an, at an early stage of the process. And, um, but we can already say that with our doubts that uh, companies that do not remain extremely competitive on this front will be eliminated from, uh, from the market altogether by just the regular market forces. And for supply chain, the biggest challenge is a cultural one. You see, this is not a technical problem. This is a cultural problem. And um, software engineering challenges the very way we even look and approach problems. Uh, most intuitive solutions tend to be wrong, spectacularly so. Um, if, in a way, software engineering in supply chain is about taming chaos, you know, taming all the complexity and uncertainty that happens to be all over the place in supply chain. And, um, and in order to tame this chaos, um, which will be the job of those, you know, software engineers that will engineer the software to do that, if the process itself is, uh, is too polished, too ordered, if the process itself is not, does not have, uh, I would say, an element of chaos at its core, then essentially, um, there is no room left for, uh, for, for, for change, for chance, for creativity. And, uh, and so the, what is perceived as excellence uh, very quickly devolved into stagnation and, and, and then followed by, by failure. And for more traditional companies, the biggest challenge from uh, this cultural approach, beside, I would say, the, the, the culture shock, is... Um, to let go of the illusion of control. You know, your five years ERP migration plan is a delusion. You have no idea uh, whether it's actually a good idea or the way you're doing, you, you know, you have no control over such a massive project. Um, similarly, 
your business case that outline you know, the expected profits of your current initiative is also an illusion. And um, when tackling mechanization of, uh, the, of the intellectual work, um, the biggest danger is not doing things that you cannot fully rationalize. The biggest danger is uh, to do things that are completely irrational under the guise of rationality. Excellent. So, let's have a look at the question. By the way, the next lectures will happen uh, on, uh, on Wednesday. It will be December, uh, December 15th, Wednesday. Same time, 3 p.m. time of Paris. And now I will, and it will be about um, cyber security. And now I will have a look at the question. The first question is from Chris Peterson. How do you measure the capitalistic return on your software investments? Mostly, uh, mostly you don't. And it's, again, um, or, or rather, you, the measurement is the byproduct of the undertaking itself. You see, it is, it is something that is puzzling. If you, if you say, I want to measure the return on investment, it assumes that you can come up with a measurement before, or at least that is typically what is frequently implied with this sort of question. It assumes that you can come up with this measurement before so that you can build your kind of business case with scenarios, and then you can make a decision, and then um, you go through or not with your software investment. What I'm saying is that it doesn't work that way. With software, uh, it's literally, first you do the thing, then you learn what has to be learned, and then along the way, you will even learn what sort of, of benefits there is. And to guide your action, you, need, you, you can't do anything but have some kind of high-level understanding. Again, the lesson is not to do things randomly. This is not what I'm saying, you know, about the sort of lessons about software engineering, is to not do things that are deeply irrational under the guise of rationality. This is, you know, my final lesson. Uh, High-level intuition, you know, if you're absolutely convinced about something and it, may, and it really, your guts tell you this is the correct path, it can be a much more rational, uh, you know, uh, argument compared to fancy calculation that only have the pretense of rationality, but the numbers, they are just garbage. So you see, and, and when I say, how do you measure? Then the reality is that as you, as you progress for your software undertaking, well, the measurements will become clearer because you will start learning about what you're trying to achieve, and then you will learn how to uh, measure the adequacy of what you're doing with what you should be doing. So you see, the, the measurement is something that will come as a byproduct if you do it well. However, uh, as, as a, you know, a, a consequence of this, it means that uh, as far as software is concerned, it is, uh, it is much better to just try stuff uh, and, and, and fail fast. You, you don't want to engage yourself into some kind of massive uh, other commitment. You just, it's better to do it in ways that are incredibly incremental, just f fewer people, high productivity, you learn along the way, you learn how you should, um, uh, how should you proceed. But then comes another problem is that as soon as you start doing that, you, the management in the companies need to be able to jungle with many, many initiative at the same time. And this is very disconcerting, especially for uh, more traditional companies because management is not expected, uh, do not expect to have so many initiatives, all of this all going in different direction. And yet this is exactly what, is, what has already been happening in large software companies for, um, uh, for four decades now. And this is one of the essence of uh, the sort of, I would say, takeaway from software engineering from a, a, a human perspective. Another question from uh, an anonymous contributor. Isn't it a contradiction to say uh, that those with many keywords don't associate with a particular technology? Well, I don't say that having many keywords, you know, um, protect you from associating yourself with one particular technology. Uh, those, there are two, two different problems. There is one, there is a problem of having a person 
that has an association, a strong association between their personal identity, their perceived identity about their person and their skill set. That's you know, problem number one. And the problem number two is that uh, building your resume comes with a, a, very, a, a very strong latent conflict of interest. And, and thus, my message is, on one side, beware of those identity politics. They are incredibly toxic. And then my second message is, beware of uh, conflict of interest under all their forms. They are incredibly toxic as well. Um, now, if you really super emphasize you know, one technology in particular, um, you, you, may, you may, on your resume, just you know, put, uh, I would say, uh, remove sort of keywords for, for tech that you, that you disapprove of. Uh, however, you know, this, is, this is a bit fringe. Um, usually, you know, the two problems are separate, and you can even have someone who says, you know, um, uh, my identity is I am a Python programmer, as I was you know, showing in a slide. And then on your resume, put you know uh, 20 plus keywords. The, the two things are not exclusive. You know they can they can even happen one hand. And also don't underestimate the fact that sometimes the identity is you can associate your identity to something that you just want that is aspirational, something that you want to acquire. So you want to say, I am yes. So far I've been programming Python, but I want to become a Rust programmer. So I'm going to consider myself as a as a Rust programmer. Although so far I have mostly done Python. You know, all those sorts of, 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 of behavior are possible. A question from Alexei Tikhonov. Software engineering is considered to be an auxiliary science for supply chain. What would be auxiliary sciences for <laughs> software engineering? Uh, probably psychology and sociology and, uh, um, and all those you know, sort of, uh, and, and probably also ethnology. It, it's mostly, as I said, if you start approaching that through, you know, uh, as, as essentially the, the interaction of people, then I would say that if people want to, to do some really serious work about software engineering, um, this is not about the software technology, although you, you need to really understand the software context so that the sort of interaction between the people makes sense, you know. Uh, at least for you, you don't, you don't necessarily need to understand. For example, you don't necessarily need to understand what goes into the code, but you need to understand what, what I mean when, when I say, for example, that there is a code base at play or, you know, the sort of, sort of tools that exist and sort of problems that they are trying to solve. Um, but, but yes, software engineering has tons of software, uh, of auxiliary sciences of its own. Uh, here, for, for uh, the purpose of this series of supply chain lectures, I need to draw a line in the sand deciding what I include, what I do not include, because, you see, I, I obviously cannot cover every single field of research ever, you know, uh, ever treated. Um, a question from Jess Bankston. Ask 10 clever people to bring uh, a solution. They will come with uh, more than 10 ways. Uh, agreed. Uh, any one of the top five would be fine and used consistently better. How do you balance those two conflicting approach and benefits? Um, that's first one of the thing. Uh, again, if I if I try to to frame the question in the specific case of software engineering, because otherwise it's it's a very 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 broad question. In the specific field of software undertaking, um, you can have uh, um, many many propositions, but not all propositions should be considered with equal weight. First, there is something that I did not discuss in this lecture, is that um, there is such a skill as having a long-term view of software. You see, this, when I say you should focus on what do not change, it turned out that there are some people that are very, very good at this work and some people that are very bad. So it's, I, I'm not sure exactly how I would you know, completely um, uh, rationalize a test for that, but it just happened. First, um, if I, uh, their experience comes into play. If you want to look at this kind of who has the skills for this long-term view, who has the skills for uh, what do not change, in my humble experience, I've never met young software engineers that were doing that. It's typically the sort of things that it takes people that have at least 35 
years old or something, you know, to, to kind of start getting very good at that. And the very best people are people that are, you know, over 60. And indeed, it takes years and years and experience to, to see the motion, to see the patterns. Thus, when you say that you have that many people, I think one illusion is that all of those things, um, they look, you know, good, but that's just an appearance. You, you don't know. Um, so first, the thing is that you, you, you need to set yourself to see how much, you know, sort of effort it will take to test out the waters. You know, can you just prototype or, or, or test it out to sort? Uh, and then do you have, among those 10 people, do you have some people that have some unique skills at identifying solution that will be poison on the long term? Remember that, you know, your maintenance costs are essentially driven by decisions that you've taken. So if you can, is there in, the, in those other solutions, is there some, some implicit important decision that is being made, a decision that can, uh, you know, uh, that can really uh, hurt us on the long run? This is a tricky sort of thing. And by the way, somebody who has, I would say, the long view, one way to, that I can think of to identify this sort of skill is that those people will be able to explain why this option on the long run is going to you know, generate all sorts of problems. Uh, it's not like just a hunch or intuition. They will tell you, oh, this sort of thing, been there, done that. I've seen that in some other products. You know, there is a, this saying, um, the smart man learns from his own mistake, but the wise man learns from the mistakes of others. This is very applicable to this case. Another question from Pencash Nanani. How do enterprise measures the increase in operation efficiency per dollar invested implementing the software for supply chain? Ah, this is incredibly difficult as uh, a question. Um, you see, the thing is that, uh, and I will maybe approach this problem in, uh, in a later lecture. Uh, the problem is literally the incommensurability of paradigms. I'm sorry for, for this jargon. Uh, it comes from, uh, from epistemology. The idea is that when you go from a paradigm, a way to operate, to another paradigm, and those paradigms are radically different, I mean, most of the measures are just pointless. You see, uh, if, uh, if I was, um, ju just think of it for a second, just to understand, uh, giving you an example. Let's look at telesales versus e-commerce. Telesales or selling at a distance, you know, catalog based selling, uh, sorry, mail order company, sorry, the, the keyword I was looking, mail order companies versus e-commerce. Mail orders companies had been around for, um, since the mid 19th century. And the question is that if you start looking at e-commerce as an improvement over mail order companies, you could say, I'm going to measure the improvement. But the reality is that virtually every single mail order company went bankrupt, while um, e the, 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 the e-commerce companies that dominate nowadays first are several orders of magnitude bigger than the biggest uh, mail order company ever was. You know, just think of Amazon versus um, the biggest uh, historical mail order company. Amazon is probably 100 times larger than the biggest mail order company. Uh, and, uh, and the comparison, there are so many lines have been shifted that it's, that is very, very blurry. And that's why, that's why uh, uh, the me more generally, the mechanization of intellectual work is so incredibly troubling and puzzling, is that it is not like the physical realm. You know, the physical realm, you could think, I am with my factory, I am producing this many cars per minute. I have, you know, some all sort of very canonical way to measure my efficiency. With, um, with, um, uh, when you start going into this 21st century sort of approach where you mechani mechanize your, um, um, your, your intellectual work, what does efficiency even more even mean? You see, ju just think the extreme. Just think of what does improving the efficiency even mean for a company like Amazon. All their s supply chain is completely driven by software. So if people were just staying at home and not doing anything, I suspect, minus you know, the occasional problem, bug, crash, and whatever, 
I suspect that the entire supply chain would just run just fine, even if all those engineers were doing nothing for a day or two. So you see, uh, the, so why is even Amazon keeping those engineers around then? Well, because they invest in their uh, improvements. And by the way, the interesting thing is that if you read the sort of memos that, uh, that Bezos has, he has one very specific uh, management process called disagree but commit. So he says that there are projects where my gut feeling tell me as a CEO, it's wrong. I, I disagree with this project. And yet, I disagree but I commit. So I disagree with your project. Okay, I, I, I'm not agree. But because I've heard you and I trust you, I'm going to commit to support you budget-wise in your initiative. So it's kind of weird. You know, it's kind of a schizophrenic in a way. It is like, I disagree with that. I'm the CEO. I'm supposed to be the ultimate, you know, uh, the ultimate authority in the company, but I really increase this authority and I just say, I disagree, but you know what? You can, you can have the budget. Uh, you can still have the budget and proceed. And the reason is that software undertakings, most of them are fairly cheap. Thus, if someone comes with a fairly crazy idea, but it's not very expensive. It's not going to bankrupt your company. And although it looks like a kind of a bad idea, but if it works, it can be a brilliant idea. Then why not give a try, even if you're convinced that it's not the case? I mean, if you've hired those very smart people, uh, give them a chance. Maybe you know, those very smart people know things that you don't. And uh, so you see, this is, this is a sort of culture shock when you go from traditional um, supply chain companies where um, the, the management is supposed to have the vision and supposed to drive the, 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 you know, all the teams into, uh, into the battle and, and, and command. Here, when you enter the, the, the realm of software, um, leadership is, <laughs> is mostly about kind of sorting out all the sort of problems that emerge in your little tribes of, uh, of software engineers. It, uh, it is not about... Uh, uh, trying to yourself have all the intelligence to replace all the people, you know, uh, to command all the, all the people that are uh, under, uh, underneath you. Uh, and also this is, you see, uh, a very, very anecdotal example. At LOCAD, for my own initiatives in terms of investment, software investments, for um, how do I you know, invest in terms of tech, I never really think in terms of, of dollars of returns. Uh, my only guiding thinking is, is it something that is of, of foundational importance for supply chain? If it is an element of foundational importance, so it's literally absolutely core to a large variety of supply chain situation, then we have to do it. And this is it. You see, end of the story. This is if it's something that is, um, and, and again, just think an example. If... Um, if you happen to be operating in the operative, uh, in the automotive aftermarket, you're selling, you know, second, you're, you're selling car parts for, for, for repairs of cars, then tackling the problem of the mechanical compatibility, you're not selling parts to serve um, people, you're selling cars, parts to serve cars, and a, a, a same part can be compatible with multiple vehicles, and some parts might have mechanical overlap. This is a problem of primary importance for the automotive aftermarket. So you, you, you need to tackle this problem frontally. It is not a problem of ROI. This is literally a problem of, it, it needs to be addressed. This is your core business. If you don't, somebody else will do for you. And, uh, and, and then a decade later, you will be pushed out of the market. You know, it's, it's not a matter of ROI. However, again, software is cheap. You don't relatively, relatively cheap. Uh, I, I'm not saying that you should push, you know, 20 million euro or dollars on every single crazy idea. But spending six months and uh, and and two engineer on something, yeah, why not? I mean, again, if it's not, if it's not insane, if it's, uh, if 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 uh, if for the budget, if for the company, you're taking absolutely no risk of bankrupting the company, then you should accept this sort of taking this sort of risk continuously and actually. This is not accept, but even embrace, because that's where uh, the, the, the innovation comes from. A question from Victoria Knight. It's misleading to say that large project teams are ludicrous ADS ERPs, as a 10-person team might be good for development, but not much else. A tower requires more people. Uh, a tower requires more people than a house to build it. Could you clarify your comment? 
Ah, I'm going to take a position that is, uh, that is going to antagonize a lot of people. You see, there are uh, the, 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 the lifestyle, the revenue of millions of people uh, depends on those incredibly large IT companies. You see, again, uh, I, I just said, you know, during this lecture, IT companies represent three, the, uh, three million American employees, you know, in the USA in 2020. So when I say that there is absolutely no reason to have an ERP taking that many people, uh, obviously all the people who are making a living being either because they are selling the super large teams or because they are part of such a large team are going to vehemently disagree with me. And, uh, and my counterpoint is that does your disagreement comes from um, the fact that you have, I would say, you have core scientific reason to explain why the work cannot be done with much fewer people or is it in your own financial interest to just maintain the status quo and have an army of people to do the work. You see, if we look at all the innovation that took place, uh, this is uh, the, the creative destruction, you know, that was outlined by the economist Schumpeter. Every single time there was uh, uh, an innovation, it was um, the, those important economic innovation, there was usually massive productivity improvement, but all the people that were kind of, you know, behind the curve, they fought to the bitter end to kind of prevent this innovation from taking place. Right now, you see, ERPs are nothing new. ERPs have been around for um, essentially four decades. Uh, most of the ERPs that I see nowadays, and again, uh, when I say ERP, um, I believe that it's a misnomer. I, it's, it's not enterprise resource planning, it's just enterprise resource management. So all of those uh, products that should rather be named ERMs, um, they don't, Naturally, add that much value uh, compared to the one that pe that company had uh, uh, one or two decades ago. You know, uh, I I've seen plenty of fairly old ERPs that are just fine. And when I notice, you know, five years down the road, the new ERP, it's not actually substantially better, uh, and certainly it's not worth the millions that have been poured into the, the ERP migration. And also, I see that in this sort of massive, and I'm taking this, those ERP projects as, as a key example, in those massive projects, I see that the, the productivity is absolutely abysmal from the IT companies. You know, I, uh, it is usually, it is, it, is, it is done in a way that literally maximizes the number of man days that people put on the case. Again, that's those kilo days that are being sold. Um, there, there were people that were already in the 70s saying those man months were ludicrous. And, uh, and guess what? Uh, the situation is now vastly worse than it was decades ago. So does it really take these sort of things? My counterpoint would be just look, when you tell me that it needs to have this many people, I would say, does it? Does it? Because really, when you start looking at how many people, you know, uh, some companies like, let's say, GD.com or uh, Amazon.com, or uh, Rakuten, how, ma how many people does those companies need to accomplish the same sort of things? Usually you end up with uh, ratios that are completely insane. Uh, for example, uh, let's say Zalando, uh, a very, uh, very well-known, you know, a large um, uh, European e-commerce based in, in Berlin, Germany, they have built their own ERP. And they are doing that with a team, uh, the chance to meet the team, with a team that is actually smaller than most of the teams that I've seen for companies of, the, of a similar size compared to Zalando, that they need to migrate their ERP. So you see, on one side, you have a company, let's say Zalando, that is capable of engineering their own ERP. It's completely tailored to their need. It is doing a very, very good job at being a good ERP for them. And the cost they are, uh, and, uh, and the sort of number of people is only a fraction of what other companies of a similar size need to merely do a version upgrade. So, and, and, the, and the cost is, again, only a fraction. So really, I challenge, I challenge whether you, you need, and that's the problem also with, the, you see, that's the problem with um, white collar work in this 21st century, is that to be a very, very good employee, it means that you need to have the courage to automate yourself, to make yourself obsolete. This is, this is something very weird. You see, that's why when the blue collars were being made obsolete, 
it was just done by other people. But nowadays, in our, there, is no, there is almost no blue collar left. I mean, there are still you know, about a million in France, for example, compared to those 27 million people sitting in offices. But the thing is that uh, it takes a very different sort of mindset. And, uh, and that's, why, um, that's why I see that there is this struggle to come to this new paradigm that is mostly coming from the software industry where it's just fine to make yourself obsolete because actually you're not making yourself obsolete for real. There is not like a, a, a limit to human ingenuity. You're just making some sort of task, uh, you know, automated and that let you, that free you to challenge, to go to the next challenge that is even more interesting than the previous one. So you see, it's not as if uh, it's not as if Amazon was firing their software engineer as soon as they solve a problem. You know, people solve the problem, fine. They, Amazon just rewards those people and then they promote them to tackle a next more difficult problem. They don't just fire them and saying, thank you, good job, you've solved the problem, now we can fire you. This is absolutely not how I would say the, the 21st century sort of, uh, this is absolutely not the sort of 21st century market dynamics that we see. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, another question from uh, an anonymous person. Um, supply chain practitioners are stuck in post-World War II analytical thinking. I agree. For many companies, not all, but for many companies, I agree. Software engineering has moved on a long time ago. I also agree with this statement and defines itself as uh, a people process. In other words, an interpretive process. Um, do you agree? Uh, on, yes, I mean, I'm not absolutely sure of the inter uh, interpretive process, but um, uh, just the terminology, sorry, I, I'm not absolutely sure of what exactly you mean, but as a people process, I would say absolutely, absolutely. And this is this thing, is that the software industry, when I say, uh, you see, the, the problem is the sort of culture shock. It is not, you see, when you approach the software industry, what you see is all these technologies, all those complicated piece of super technical elements. And that gives you the sort of false impression that it's all about hard, uh, hard technologies, core technologies, and that you have to be, let's say, a brilliant mathematician, a brilliant physicist to be good in the software industry. Uh, uh, absolutely not. Um, I'm not saying that there are no position to do that. Uh, clearly, for example, if you want to um, uh, to do uh, scientific calculation or you know some very very specific things, you will need to have incredible quantitative technical skills. However, um, uh, yes, the, the bulk of the software industry is is perceiving itself as you know a sort of a, a people-minded approach, a sort of, of culture. You see, a culture that is shared. And, uh, and by the way, that is also to a large extent, I believe, explaining the sort of dominance that, um, that the US and Silicon Valley has on software over the world is that it is actually very, very difficult to replicate a culture. It is something that tends to be very intangible. You, it's, it's very difficult to document because when you document it, you tame, you know what I, I was describing about this ingredient of chaos that you need. If you, if you document the culture, if you just organize, if you process it, suddenly you lose that aspect of raw, chaotic, you know, um, uh, emergence of, of ideas, of innovations. And thus, um, I believe that, you know, that uh, there are places like, uh, like the Silicon Valley where obviously this, this culture is very prevalent. Uh, they are ahead of time. Uh, in, the, in this regard, the, uh, uh, to conclude on this area, I would say that you know the, the future. That was a, a, a quote from Gibson. The future is already there. It's just not evenly distributed. So I see that you know th this culture is now, I would say, being replicated on much more scales in many many other places, and the process will um, continue uh, uh, over time and grow over time. Excellent. Thus, uh, see you next time. Next time, we will dis be discussing something that can be fairly depressing, but it's very important. We'll be discussing cybersecurity. See you next time.